ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to this PhD defense by Pablo Javier Koch. My name is Paul Jörg Mortost. I'm a professor here at DTU, and I'll be your chairman today. A special welcome, of course, to you, Pablo. Thank it you. It wouldn't be the same without you. <laughs> <laughs> and a special welcome to our evaluation committee, consisting of research scientist Ben Hohen from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, it's Ben in the middle over here, and uh, to associate professor Søren Toy Olsen from Copenhagen University, and to our own chairman of the committee, Fritz Müller Anderson, who is professor here at DGU Manchester. And also a welcome to the supervisors, the main supervisor, Henrik Penge Jakobsen, professor here at DGU Management, and the co-supervisor, Jakob Lappenburg, professor at DGU. And uh, I would like to say already now, thank you to you guys for all your efforts in relation to this PhD. So the title of Pablo's defense, his thesis, is the economics of print integration and acceptance cost perspectives. And it's been carried out here at TTU Management. So now we're almost ready to go. Pablo, just a few words on the procedure. Pablo, you yes. sit 45 minutes. No Great. more. Otherwise, you know, I will stop you. Deal. And then after that, we will have a short break, and then the evaluation committee will have their chance to put questions and comments to Pablo. And uh, following that, if we have the time, the supervisors <coughs> will have a chance to ask questions and give comments. And you, any audience, you are also welcome to ask questions still if we have the time. But if you want to do so, please report to me here in the break. So, uh, and actually, we have to say that the defense has to be finished no later than 4 o'clock. So, uh, and we do not need to use all the time, <laughs> but of course you're welcome. So, and uh, following the defense, then we will have a reception in building 426, just afterwards, it's just around the corner. So, those of you that, we would very much like all of you, of course, to join us at this reception. And I believe that sets the stage for you, Pablo. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I'll get started then. Thank you very much all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's very nice to see friendly faces. Uh, and I will try to present what I've been doing for the last three and a half years on my Economics of Wind Integration project for my PhD. And as I said, this is about wind. But whenever I talk about wind in Denmark, I really like this picture. This picture is from the 70s. Uh, during the oil crisis, a moment in which, due to the fact that 95% of Danish energy was imported, the high prices for oil and lack of availability created great problems, to the point that certain days it was not allowed to drive your car on the street. This, in my perspective, was one of the main drivers for the transformation of the Danish energy system. Nowadays, some decades later, of course, this transformation has continued with different goals, different objectives, and different institutions. Nowadays, the main driver for the transformation and development of the Danish energy system is related to renewability, sustainability and renewable energy. We're aiming for fossil-free energy systems, for reduced emissions, and an increased share of renewables. These goals are both from the Danish government and from the EU context. Now, in Denmark, to achieve these goals, wind has been decided to play a very big factor in the previous decades and in the future. Nonetheless, nonetheless, despite the broad acceptance for the agreement of expanding renewable energy based on wind, there's been certain controversies or resistance to future wind projects. For example, opposition against onshore windmills that people don't like. Then, governments have provided alternatives like siting offshore wind farms closer to the shore, which are cheaper. But of course, the neighbors also complain about the fact that they want to have the wind turbine farms further away from the coast. And, and at this point, this kind of creates a feeling for some people, for some researchers, that resistance to wind energy is a bit unfair or is a bit based on just not in my backyard aspect of it. Now, with this background, my PhD aims at investigating a bit this aspect of resistance and to see if this resistance can be quantified as acceptance costs. So what I try to do here is that I look at the expansion of wind energy in Denmark from two perspectives. On the left-hand side, yes, left-hand side, 
uh, you have like what are the technical costs, which is quite researched, referring to the investment costs like CAPEX, operation and maintenance costs, integration costs of the grid. And on the other side, we have what I call acceptance costs. And these acceptance costs reflect the social cost uh, associated to the expansion of wind energy. Now, the term acceptance costs is not really a well-defined term, and it's a tricky term to define. <coughs> uh, for the purposes of my thesis, I limited the scope of acceptance costs just to the disamenities produced by visual and noise aspects. Of course, discussions can be had about how acceptance costs could be expanded to include all relevant externalities. And the main question that I'm trying to address is, are these costs comparable? Are technical costs and acceptance costs lying on the same order of magnitude, for example? Now, based on this, I formulated a series of research questions, first aiming at how we can estimate these acceptance costs, which drivers, which qualities of wind turbines or wind turbine farms are driving these costs. And if we were able to calculate these costs, how can we create then cost curves that integrate both technical costs with acceptance costs? And finally, is it possible to include these cost curves into a cost-efficient deployment path for Danish wind expansion that looks not only at the technical but also at the social aspect? Now, these research questions have been addressed uh, over six different papers that address not completely, I mean, every paper is focused on an area more than others. And these six papers are based, I began with my first paper doing a systematic review where I introduced a classification framework for visualizations in stated preference studies based on surveys. Um, and this together with my second paper, which is an analysis on biases produced by screen sizes, are basically a methodological criticism in regards to how we are carrying out these kind of studies. The third paper is an analysis of preferences, and it's a bit more applied, applying one of these stated preference studies to trying to estimate acceptance costs. The fourth paper, paper D, is a comparative study where we take three different methods for estimating acceptance costs, and we try to integrate them with technical cost curves for wind energy in Denmark and see if they're comparable. Paper E is a bit of a different paper, and it deals with the cost of integration. How can we integrate increased wind energy in Denmark by utilizing demand flexibility as a provider of reserves? And the final paper is a natural experiment that looks into the dynamic aspects of preferences for wind energy in Denmark. Now, this is quite a big topic, so today I'm going to focus just on three of these papers, and we'll get started with paper C. Now, paper C uh, deals with preferences for wind energy in Denmark. And it's based on a study where we ask people to compare their preferences for, for both onshore and offshore wind turbine farms. Now, the general idea is that we have this trade-off where offshore wind turbine farms have higher cost but lower visual impact, they're further away from the houses, whereas onshore wind turbines have a, high, have a higher visual impact because they're closer to houses, but cheaper cost. Beyond this, there's also specific attributes that we would like to study. That is, the amount of turbines, or their size, or in which area of Denmark we're going to put the offshore wind farms. And further, we included spatial data analysis. So how does the spatial information of the respondents affect their preferences? For example, how many wind turbines do they see from their house or how far away from the coast do they live? So this is the idea of what we're studying in this paper. And we carried out this paper based on a survey from 2012, designed by Jakob here, which is a choice experiment. And it has 1,753 respondents. And each respondent was presented with four choice sets. And in these four choice sets, they have to choose between two alternatives, which can be onshore, offshore, or one of each. Each alternative has a specific distance, for example, distance to the house of the wind turbine, or a distance from the shore for the offshore wind farm, the amount of turbines, the cost associated to that option, which is expressed as kronor per household per year, to be paid by the respondent's household, and the location, for example, of the proposed offshore wind farm. And the scenario setting for this is a hypothetical expansion of 450 megawatts of offshore and or onshore wind power. 
these 450 megawatts will be placed either in this scenario as one big offshore wind farm or distributed across 150 different locations in Denmark. Either one of them is either on the respondent's neighborhood or in a neighboring municipality. And on top of this survey, as I did, we did some GIS analysis, geographical information systems, where based on location information of respondents, we try to then create measures of distances to relevant spots, like for example, distances to proposed sites. And based on this, we try to see how do these two sites affect each other? How does spatial data influence the preferences for wind energy? The modeling we did is based on a mixed logic model. It's a regression model that aims at estimating the probability of a respondent choosing a certain alternative based on the attributes of that alternative. And in particular, it's called a mixed logic model because it assumes that not all of the attributes or the coefficients associated to attributes are scalar, but actually they are random variables that can have different distributions. And we modeled both the particular attributes of each option and we added an alternative specific constant which defines if it's an onshore or an offshore project. And this alternative specific constant will give us information in regards to what is the intrinsic value of a project being offshore over being onshore. And these preferences, you can estimate the coefficients which will give you an indication in terms of odds ratio of preferences, but that is not so intuitive to understand. So the analysis is based on willingness to pay. And willingness to pay is a monetary expression that measures how much people will be willing to pay for a particular attribute. For example, for citing a wind turbine at 1,000 meters from your house instead of 500 meters. And in practical terms, it's given by the ratio between a specific coefficient divided by the cost coefficient of the model. So what do we find? For onshore, we find results that are quite consistent with previous literature, which is nice. It gives us a sense that we're going in the right direction. Uh, we see that people prefer higher distances. So people prefer wind turbines that are sited further away from your house. Uh, they prefer to put these wind turbines in areas that have fewer neighbors. Uh, they prefer few big turbines in comparison to many smaller turbines. The baseline attribute was four turbines of 750 kilowatts and they prefer either one three megawatt turbine or two 1.5 megawatt turbines. And we found though that the interaction between the number of turbines and the distance was insignificant. It did not have a significant relevance, uh, which after further analysis we realized it was a limitation of the study design because by putting both offshore and onshore alternatives, people that are very opposed to the visual impact and to onshore, they will not choose putting onshore turbines further away, but they will just go all the way offshore. And therefore that limits the amount of responses we have on the onshore sample. For offshore, we found also nice drivers, very relevant and significant results. Particularly, they prefer also longer distances we found out that the preference for 18 and 50 kilometers is actually equal. They don't care if it's 50 or 18. And that makes sense because after 18 kilometers, the change on the visual impact is extremely limited. There's almost no difference between how a wind turbine farm can be observed from 18 kilometers or 50. Whereas the cost does make a big difference. We saw that there were no strong preferences for location. But the most relevant result that we found is that there are extremely significant preferences for citing wind turbine farms offshore. That is, the willingness to pay associated to this coefficient, the alternative specific concept, is extremely high. And not only that, but we realize that the respondents are much less sensitive to costs when dealing with offshore alternatives. And that means that basically they really want to cite wind turbines offshore, they're willing to pay a lot for it, and they don't really care how much they're paying. Mm. Now, we also wanted to have a bit of an investigation in terms of the spatial data and the socioeconomic data. And in this image, you can see three curves that represent what is the willingness to pay depending on the age of the respondent. And I would like to focus on the top line, the blue one, uh, because this one represents how much people are willing to pay for citing the wind turbine farm offshore instead of onshore. And what we can see is that the age effect is quite consistent with previous literature. 
it is normally expected that older people tend to have less cost sensitivity to certain alternatives. And we can see in here that if you move to the right, which is higher ages, the willingness to pay becomes higher and higher. Younger people are willing to pay less than older people. There are certain possible explanations for this. It can be related to place attachment. They don't want to change how their house has been or the view of the family neighborhood forever. Also can be related to the fact that they have more available money for spending just on themselves. And it is extremely consistent with results we expected for previous literature. What we can also see is that this effect is seen on the other willingness to pay. For example, for citing onshore wind turbines at 1,000 meters, which is the red line, or for putting offshore turbines at 50 kilometers, which is the green line. But the effect is most significant when we're looking at offshore versus onshore. And you can see that the magnitude of the willingness to pay, this 1,034 kronor per household per year for the group of 70-year-old respondents, is much higher than the willingness to pay for the same group for the other alternatives. Then we looked at the effect of the number of turbines seen on preferences. So depending on how many turbines the respondent can see from its house, how does its willingness to, change, uh, willingness to pay change? We see that there's a diminishing willingness to pay. The more wind turbines you see, the less you're willing to pay to reduce them or move them offshore. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. What is the difference between having 11 or 12 wind turbines in terms of your view? Probably not so much as having no turbines and then having the first one installed. <clears throat> and of course we can see that the stronger preferences in terms of willingness to pay is at the zero turbines. So people that don't have wind turbines around their house are very willing to pay to keep it that way. Either by moving them onshore, offshore, excuse me, or to siting them further offshore or further onshore. Now, based on these kind of measures that we got for willingness to pay, we are interested in comparing the cost curves for offshore and onshore. And that's what paper D is about. So the starting point is calculating a technical cost curve. What is the technical cost of further expanding wind energy in Denmark, either onshore or offshore? And we represent these costs with something called levelized cost of energy uh, or levelized cost of electricity. And this LCOE measure uh, associates the installation costs for the project with the amount of energy that will be produced along the, across the lifetime of the project. And we do this both for onshore and offshore. Afterwards, we calculate acceptance costs. But we calculate acceptance costs by comparing three different methods. We have method A, which is based on a study by Energinet, that they look at the compensation payments that people in Denmark get when they put wind turbines nearby their houses. And method B looks at the loss of the property values. How do house transactions reflect the fact that the prices go down when there's a turbine nearby? And method C is based on the previous paper where we calculate the willingness to pay based on a stated preference study. And one of the big questions that we have in this paper is, are these measures comparable? Because these three methods come from the very different areas. They utilize quite different data, quite different methods. So it is quite interesting to see if they produce comparable results. Now, after we calculate these acceptance costs, we introduce them into the LCOE cost curves. And then we have a cost curve that includes both technical and acceptance costs. For the case of offshore, we use as a reference uh, offshore wind farms that are far, far offshore, and that means that they don't have any noise or visual impact. For the case of this thesis, then, we consider they have no acceptance costs. And finally, once we have these cost curves that includes the LCOE and the acceptance costs, we can try and compare onshore versus offshore. And the question is a bit more practical now. Are they in the same range? Is there any kind of doubt regarding which option is better or not? economically speaking. For the technical onshore cost curve, uh, we based uh, the calculations on data provided by the Danish TSO, the Transmission System Operator, NEGNET, where they do an analysis of what would it take to expand uh, onshore energy in Denmark for the year 2030, and they look at 1,018 different sites that are possible to utilize to put onshore wind turbines. Uh, 
up to 12 gigawatts of potential. Now, these costs are relatively low, are quite optimistic, but they're very much in range with very recent publications and estimations of LCE. For the case of offshore, it is a bit more tricky. Uh, we found several studies where they aim at predicting or estimating what's going to be the cost for offshore projects. And they have an extremely wide range, as you can see, there's dots all over the place, all the way from 8.2 to 20 euro sets per kilowatt. But nonetheless, the latest auction here in Denmark was at a price close to 5 euro cents. So the predictions that we've had before have not been very much in range. And not only that, when we want to look at a cost curve, what we want is not just the price, but we want to associate this price with the expansion. So how does this price evolve as we build more and more wind turbines in Denmark? And we found a study based on the Resolve model by Boyskens from 2011, where he does exactly this for Denmark. He tries to associate the levelized cost of energy with the exploitation of further offshore capacity. Nonetheless, similarly to the previous uh, estimations of LCE, his starting point is quite unoptimistic. So what we do to deal with this is we adjust this curve based on the values obtained from the latest auctions. In this case, what we're assuming is that the behavior of LCIE as expansion uh, increases is maintained in both analyses. For example, that we're going to choose the cheapest offshore sites for first, the sites that have the most wind resources, high uh, full load hours. But then, as we utilize more and more of these sites, we have to deal with higher water depths further offshore, and therefore the price will go up. Method A, just so you know, is based on this Energinet study, and it looks at three different kinds of compensation. It looks at a compensation for a municipality, so the developer has to pay to the municipality uh, for installing the project. Furthermore, if properties are between 4 to 10 turbine heights, which is close to 400 to 1,000 meters, uh, they get a compensation, the house owners. And if the properties are too close, that is below 4 wind turbine heights, actually they estimate they have to purchase the property at 150% value. And this is what they use as a measure for calculating this cost curve. So the technical cost for expanding off um, onshore turbines is given by this orange line. But when you include these compensation payments, the shape changes quite a bit. And we can see that on the extreme right, there's a spike in price. And that is given by the necessity of purchasing properties when you're reaching the total available capacity. So that means that as you expand more onshore energy, you need to find sites that are closer to people's properties. You have to compensate more people, and finally you end up having to purchase properties to put wind turbines on those areas. Uh, oh yeah, I had the explanation over here. The second method is based uh, on a study by people from IFO, uh, by Jensen, Togepanduo, and Thomas Lundheller, I believe. And what they do is a revealed preference study based on hedonic pricing, where they look at many house transactions, 12,000, 12, I believe, yeah, 12,000 transactions in 24 areas of Denmark. And they have a geographical model where they can see if each property that has been bought and sold has, for example, a view of a wind turbine or experiences noise effects. And what they analyze is how these effects change the prices of the houses on the market. And they do find actually significant effects in terms of noise and visual impact. That means that they find, on average, a close to 10% property value loss for houses that are within the range we're considering. So we had to make some simplifications of their study. We didn't have the data that they use exactly. So for example, we simplified and we utilized distance as a proxy for noise instead of actually calculating it based on the geographical model. And what we can see is that because they're just compensating and not actually considering to purchase properties, the costs are much lower. You still have a spike when you get into these sites that are more highly populated, but the magnitude of the spike is not as big. Now the final method is based on the previous paper that I presented before, uh, where we're considering the willingness to pay that respondents presented. Now what we're using is the willingness to pay for putting wind turbines 
offshore instead of onshore. And we're using that as a measure of the total acceptance cost of onshore. And the question we have is how do we aggregate these values? In the previous case for property purchases and house transactions, it is clear that you're just looking at the local area. That is, just the houses that are directly affected. In the case of a stated preference study, the measure of value is not necessarily limited to that. And therefore you have the choice if do you want to just consider the local area or maybe extend it to the whole population of Denmark. And strong arguments can be made for both options depending on the context and the use of the study that you want to do. So we did both. Uh, we created a lower bound representing just the tiny local environment limited to the people that were affected exactly as in the same two studies. And we also aggregated our values to a national population level. What do we find? Well, we find huge variance, of course. There's, there's an extremely high change in the willingness to pay if you aggregate to a national population level. What we can see, though, is that this small local cost, this local population, small costs, have a similar behavior to what we saw on the previous methods. The willingness to pay, the LCOE considering acceptance costs is a bit lower, but still has a similar reasonable shape. And furthermore, it lays on the same range, which is quite interesting. But of course, this high uncertainty range introduces a bit of doubt in regards to what's the best aggregation method to use. Now, how does it look when you put all of them together? It looks like this. So here I put together the curves that I calculated using the three different methods, as well as the offshore curve in black or blue, black. Uh, that comes from the resolve model. First, we can see that all methods produce very similar values for levelized cost of electricity, considering acceptance costs. Nonetheless, the aggregation really has a high impact, so that will increase the uncertainty uh, or the, on the precision of our estimates. And finally, we can see that based on these three methods, in the, the three values obtained from these methods, onshore still presents a strong advantage, economically speaking, over offshore. So coming a bit back into the questions that we had at the beginning of the paper. Are these measures comparable? Are offshore and onshore in a comparable range? Well, we do find that the three methods produce comparable LCOE curves considering acceptance costs. Now, of course, there's going to be differences based on the definition and the scope for acceptance costs. And we find that onshore, onshore is still cheaper, but the difference is not extremely clear cut across the whole range. So as you exploit more, you install more wind turbines, the advantage of onshore versus offshore becomes smaller. Furthermore, we have trends that show that offshore price development is going downwards quite quickly, possibly faster than onshore. Uh, we've used relatively conservative assumptions for acceptance costs, for example, these lower bounds in terms of the only uh, local impact. And that means that differences may actually be lower than illustrated. And we're so close together at some points in the range that we may ask ourselves a question, are we actually making it cheaper? Or are we just transferring costs from developers to the population? Now, paper F, which is the last paper I'm going to talk a bit about, is about the causal effects of prior experience. And in this case, the question is, here in Copenhagen, we have this beautiful offshore wind farm, Middelgrunden which is shaped as a beautiful arc and people love, you can see it on some of the flyers for Visit Denmark. And when they created it, this happened. Like, when they created it, it was loved. But nonetheless, nowadays, you have quite a bit of resistance against new projects. People want offshore wind farms to be further ashore where they cannot be seen. And what we're trying to analyze is why is this happening? What is the dynamic nature of these preferences? Are we just bad at measuring preference before, or is it that these preferences actually change over time? And intuition can find many possible answers to why people would change their preferences. Maybe they become accustomed to seeing the turbines and they don't bother about them anymore. Maybe they become saturated and they don't want to see them anymore. Maybe they realize when they put the wind turbine that the visual impact is worse than I thought, or better. Uh, the differences between putting one wind turbine farm to two wind turbine farms to three wind turbine farms is also a possible cause of dynamic effects 
And if this were to be true, if there was a dynamic component on these preferences, what we would see is that the LCA curves that we presented before in the previous paper are not static, but they will change as time goes on because acceptance costs will change. And that may mean that the decisions that we take on the short term may put us in a trajectory that has a high cost for the whole society. So what we do is we have this paper based on a natural experiment. Uh, we have two sets of respondents. Both of them live in nearby offshore wind turbine farms. One, of them, one group in Nystad and the other group in Hornsreuve. But the big difference is that the people from Nystad cannot see, sorry, can see the offshore wind turbine farm. The people from Hornsreuve cannot see it. And what we're aiming to do is we calculate independently the preferences and willingness to pay for both samples and we compare them. Now, we control, of course, for socioeconomic changes, mobility changes to make sure that there's no self-selection bias in the sites. But the idea is that preferences should be comparable between both groups, extremely similar, unless there are dynamic effects produced by the introduction of this visual impact. And what we find is actually that the preferences and the willingness to pay are not the same. There's a, first of all, a non-parametric analysis shows that there's a difference tendency on how often people in two samples choose the minimum and the maximum cost options. We can actually see that the Newstead sample, which is the straight line, not dotted, uh, they choose significantly less the lowest cost alternative and significantly more the highest cost alternative. That means that they're much more they much more often choose the option where they have to pay more to push the wind turbines further offshore. And seldom they choose the lower cost option that maximizes visual impact. I forgot I had that, yes. We also found that the willingness to pay is different, significantly different between both sides, particularly when looking at uh, the extreme cost options, that is the minimum or maximum cost alternatives. And what does this suggest? This suggests that there is ex significant dynamic effects and that prior experience or experience with seeing wind turbine farms changes the perceptions that people have. Of course, this paper is not trying to explain why this happens. Uh, and I don't believe we can exactly say in which direction will it happen. But we're pretty clear that in this case, there is significant changes in willingness to pay produced by changes in prior experience, by differences in experience, and that it has a significant effect on the cost sensitivity. So I'm going actually quite short today, so we'll have maybe more time for questions. Going back at the structure of the PhD and the main questions, I had these two tracks, the technical costs, the acceptance costs, and going back into acceptance costs, our question was, are these methods comparable? And we find that actually, yes, the three different methods that you use for calculated, calculating acceptance costs provide us with comparable and consistent results. Of course, we saw that there are significant variations in the certainty, particularly with the stated preference experiment. But nonetheless, they're all on the same order of magnitude. They all produce results that are similar. In one of the papers that I did not talk about here, we uh, assessed the effect of integration costs and how we can minimize integration costs. And we found that actually it may be a good economical idea to utilize uh, flexible demand as a provider of reserves in the system. And this will really help to deal with the need of flexibility that you need, that you have when you expand wind energy in Denmark. And the big question was, are these costs comparables? And our answer is yes, they are quite comparable. And this really has significant implications in terms of policy and in terms of further research. Because it has the possibility of affecting the deployment path of Denmark. Uh, I, I found some policy implications and further work suggestions for this. And the first one is that we really need more, better and varied studies, both based on revealed preference or stated preference. It can be studies that analyze changes of preference over time, 
studies that are designed specifically to look at preferences in terms of, sorry, biases in the methods, like my first two papers, studies that look at preferences in different geographical areas, because it's important to note that the preferences that we see here are a reflection of Danish society. So you cannot just take these results, ship them to the United States, and expect to give you similar cost analysis. And therefore, we have a need for much wider and deeper research in the area. We can see that negative preferences go beyond this not-in-my-backyard mindset. So it's not only about people being selfish and not wanting to deal with something that will benefit society, but actually there's an economic rationale behind it. There's actual measurable, quantifiable costs. This one is very relevant maybe now uh, in terms of the energy agreement that we had some days ago, because we have to be careful regarding onshore, nearshore. We proved that both cost curves are actually quite close together and that future development in prices or in preferences have the potential to switch the ordering between which option is the best. First of all, you could see that on paper D, there were certain assumptions that had to be made. For example, in terms of the evolution of the prices for offshore or for onshore. And those are prime areas for further research. Trying to, for example, create specific cost curves for Denmark with updated data, with new technological improvements, with information from the latest auctions, for example. We saw also that the nature and drivers for dynamic preferences are a prime area to do further research. We did not try to explain why these preferences change. We just see the change and we say it is there. The methods, we were, the methods that we're using are quite descriptive and they're not aiming to try to explain the phenomenon in terms of giving psychological reasons. But nonetheless, that is extremely important. Since we know that we can have impacts on the future costs depending on which decisions we make today, an understanding of the motivations behind those preferences is really crucial. Because, as I mentioned before, if we're not careful about this, about how tight both curves can be, we may come up with solutions that are actually not cheaper, but instead we're just changing who's paying for them. Nonetheless, early expansion of onshore is still a reasonable road. Even though the curves are close together for certain expansion ranges, we found that the LCIs are quite different, specifically when you look at the possibilities of uh, improving windmills, uh, wind turbines that already exist, changing all models for bigger ones, etc. Now, another big result of, of my PhD, from my perspective, is the fact that we need to bridge more the spheres of policy making, uh, social studies, economics, technical studies. Because stuff like preferences, which is considered by, by many engineers or even economists as fluffy, has definitive impacts in terms of costs, in terms of the feasibility of future projects, etc. And it will become very hard to create reasonable policy measures if you're not able to integrate both, both spheres. And because of this, there's a need for further explanatory research. Almost all of the results that I showed are describing and maybe giving intuitions towards certain uh, explanations. But they're not studies on the psychology or, or explaining why the preferences are exactly formed like this. And nonetheless, that is an extremely interesting topic and extremely needed topic. Uh, so based on that, I think I'm done, actually. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. My pleasure. We have a short break until 10 to 2.